Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. Um, so my name is Ana Maria, um, and I'll be presenting with Marisol and Aide, and our presentation is titled Creating Sisterhood in Academia to Combat Imposter Syndrome. Um, so yes, the importance of this presentation here is really to illustrate like sisterhood within the academy. And this is like in defiance of like the hostile and very competitive environments that happen within higher education, mostly when there's not a lot of resources. And this kind of creates like a distance even amongst your like cohort and your classmates because um, you constantly feel like you have to compete with them in order to, you know, have access to the short resources that we have. Um, so me, I am Marisol. I'm one of the three academic amigas. I am a, well, I guess I would be a second year PhD student in education policy, organization, and leadership. I specifically focus my research on um, young Latinas and their access to school choice in Chicago public schools. And I also focus a lot of my research on gentrification and um, its effects on public schools in Chicago as well. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ana Maria. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Sociology. And my research focuses on race in Latin America, Afro-Latinx um, populations, but specifically the African diaspora in Colombia. And my name is Aide. I'm a second year PhD student in sociology. And my research is predominantly on the identity development of Latinos and Latinas of indigenous and Afro descent, similar to Anna living in the diaspora. So we wanted to start off our presentation with a quick icebreaker. So if you all could um, type in the chat, if you're able to, what drew you to, to join us today and what are you hoping to get out of this workshop? And we'll read a few of the responses. And just to add to what Anna said about the icebreakers, so any comments would help us into guiding the conversation. So we are talking about sisterhood and the imposter syndrome, but if there's a specific thing that drew you to this or something that you would like to get out, um, out of this workshop, that would be helpful for us as well. So we know whether or not to alternate the conversation or really emphasize on a point that you bring up. Okay. Yes, Alejandro, it is real. It is necessary. <laughs> I feel like without the sisterhood that I have found, I don't think I would have made it. Yeah. Ooh, keep sisters. Yes. That's uh, a good point. Yes. I love that. Okay, yes, coping with imposter syndrome, develop the sisterhood or activities for that group. Okay, yeah, these are all good points that we can touch on. For sure, yes. I am the one, I'm the one that's in education and I am in a PhD education program, but they are very similar to the EDD. So I can definitely provide some um, some feedback on that. An MED student. Oh yes, I am doing my MA. I'm finishing my MA in May. So <laughs> next month, I'm like, oh. Uh, so it's that's exactly the same as an MED, except for you have to do a thesis. So I can definitely help with that. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. Yes. So these Those are, are all great responses. Yes. Thank you. So if there, we'll just give it another minute. If there's anything else that people would like to share about what drew them with um, this presentation today, then we can move on. Okay, feel free to just add to the chat as we go, um, any comments that you have or questions. And then we probably won't touch on questions till the end, but it is helpful um, for us all just in case. Um, so nobody forgets. So, Let's get started then. 
And so th this is important for us as we see that Latina women um, by 2016 will represent one in five of the women that are in the education system, but yet they still rank the lowest of educational attainment and are less likely uh, to pursue education degrees. So we see that in 2013, only 19% of Latinas between 25 and 29 had completed a college degree. And this is very low, right, compared to white women who are at a 44%, Black women who are at 23 and Asian women who are at a 64%. And as you continue to grow in the education system, as you continue to get up higher into the faculty level and then tenured faculty level at Research One institutions, we see that num number dwindle to 2% as of right now. And so these spaces that uh, we are taking up and that us as mujeres are taking up at whatever level in, the, um, in higher education is really vital. And so this is kind of um, why we, when Ana and Aide and I met each other, it was so important for us to really communicate with each other and have each other's back through this process because as you continue to get along in your journey, there's less and less Latina and mujeres that you can really work with to help support you through the process. Yes. Do you want to share how we met? Oh, yes, of course. Um, so when I was in undergrad and uh, I was doing my program, I was taking a, I'm pretty sure it was like sociology and education course. I met Ana and Aide who had previously known each other and they were in class and it was my first day of class and I didn't know anyone and I was taking a graduate level class as an undergrad and I just decided to sit with them and they were like very close to each other, but they didn't know me. But every single week I sat with them and I made conversations with them and I was like, do you guys want to get lunch after class? And I really worked on like, you know, in order for you to really get to know people, you really do have to put yourself out there and like make these connections with other women. And so I knew that they were already going through the journey that I wanted to be in. Like they were already graduate students and I was an undergrad and I just felt like I could gain a lot of insight from um, having a friendship with them. And so it really happened very organically. And I guess like the more we got to know each other, the more we realized like, they love Bad Bunny Me Too. <laughs> and yeah. so we were able to bond over a lot of things. And so that friendship um, in the beginning, it really just went from like, do you guys want to hang out and uh, go to the library together? Like going to the library and finishing a paper sucks, but it's a lot better when at least you have your amigas there to help guide you, to help like read over your assignments um, or just to have someone to decompress with. Yeah. Definitely. And also given the fact that we were in the classroom and it's like we were probably three, the only Latinas in that class. So it's easy to spot and, you know, make connections with one another. So thank you, Mary. So we will be talking about imposter syndrome, right? So I wanted to do just a quick walkthrough of what imposter syndrome is. So what is an imposter? So the definition of an imposter is basically a person who is a fraud or and deceives others, right? So it's somebody who shouldn't be there or who said who claims to be someone that they're not. And so what is imposter syndrome? So it's the condition of feeling like you don't belong, doubting yourself and your abilities, especially if you're high achieving. So the concept of the imposter syndrome is that you internalize these things, even if you are succeeding, right? You may have good grades, a good GPA, you may have gotten into your grad program or the program that you want to go into, but you still have these negative talks or feelings about yourself and you're feeling mm -hmm. inadequate, like you, you shouldn't be there, right? Even if you've earned the, the right to be there, you've earned your spot at, um, in these spaces, right? And so this is basically a response of the environment. So like, as we mentioned, there's not a lot of people of color in higher ed. And as you move up in the field or in the programs, there's less and less of us. And so that is just a response to you not feeling represented. And so it's something that happens unconsciously. And so how does this function in the academy? So higher education, just like other institutions were built to favor and benefit whiteness. Therefore, non-white people struggle with navigating these spaces. So once again, we may have a lack of representation and resources. And especially if you're first gen, you're learning all of this on your own uh, with little support, right? So the importance of cultivating sisterhood will allow you to learn sort of the ropes of higher ed. And so that 
turns us to the birth of Academic Amigas. So we decided to create Academic Amigas for various reasons. So we wanted to share our experiences as PhD students with other folks, but also with each other. So we're all in different programs. It looks completely different. Some of the, the things overlap, but we're constantly helping each other just by having simple conversations about this is what I have to do. This is my program requirements and just sharing with one another some things um, on our timeline. So like, for example, if I'm doing something and one of us has that coming up soon, at least we're able to guide one another and let each other know what to expect. Um, just as well as other folks, right? And so we also utilize sisterhood for success and survival. So we're learning from one, um, one another so we can succeed in our programs academically, but also to survive in the academy. So it's one thing to make it into the program and then it's another thing to make it out. And so that's the thing we're obviously working on is we're already in our program and now it's to succeed and to graduate. And we're also resisting hegemonic whiteness. So as mentioned, the academy and other institutions benefit whiteness and as people of color, women of color, I think just being in these spaces and representing um, who we are in our communities is resistance within itself. And then lastly, we're building virtual communities. So I think one of the good things that we've got out of you know, transitioning virtually is that we're able to connect with folks that we wouldn't have connected with otherwise or participate in things like these workshops. And so we want to just build a virtual community where we can support one another. I, yeah, um, building off of that idea, I was going to say like for us, um, Academic Amigas has also always been about providing resources and just knowledge for like making it accessible for everyone else to kind of be um, be aware of. So like for everyone who is thinking of applying to grad school and, and have like no idea, right? Like a lot of us are first gen. And so we don't know what we don't know. We don't know that we're supposed to take the GRE at certain times so that we can get the score so that we can apply to the school or we don't know who we should ask for letters of recommendations um, or even what to ask in the letters. So I think like a big part of Academic Amigas was also like, how can mm -hmm. we support each other? But then like create a community where we can support like people who, who we may never meet, you know, people like making all of these resources available for people that we may never interact with, but they're interacting with our content and they mm -hmm. will gain something from it as well. Yes, that's a good point. Okay, so um, one of my personal favorite articles um, is on community cultural wealth by Tara Yoso. So this article really conceptualizes um, like community cultural wealth through a critical race theory lens. Um, and it's like very different from the cultural or the traditional interpretations of cultural capital. So within CRT, we see the shift like a lens away from like thinking of communities of color from a deficit. And it really explains how these communities of color um, are really so rich in resources and everything that they can provide for us as students. So, um, we can, instead of thinking of those communities as like cultural poverty being disadvantaged, it focuses on like the skills and abilities that are possessed by marginalized groups. And then that often go unrecognized and unacknowledged by like these major institutions. So within social capital, um, I mean, that I also talks about many different ways of cultural capital that each of us um, being of color that we hold, but specifically for this presentation, I felt that social capital really spoke to a lot of what we do. And it's um, like the network of people and the community resources um, that can be used to provide like instrumental information and emotional support that can help us like navigate through these institutions and then through these programs. So one of these examples of like how we use social capital is like reaching out to our social contacts like hey um can you help me identify a scholarship that I would be able to access and then as well would you mind reading over my response that I'm gonna submit for the um scholarship this is something that I did with Anna yesterday um <laughs> I had a scholarship that I was due yesterday and I was like Anna it's 500 words would you mind just reading it over for me because I really want this money she was like yeah I got you so it's 
It's mm -hmm. for sharing opportunities. It's always been something that you do with, you know, with your social or with, um, with the people who are in your network. So if you don't fit for a particular job, you can always share it with a friend and mm -hmm. you can help them get their opportunities. So along with, um, with that, social capital is also about like emotional support. So having a network will help you feel like you're not alone in this process of pursuing higher education. Um, those feelings of inequities, um, those microaggressions that you face by your professors, um, feeling like you are constantly having to work twice as hard as the peers in your classroom. This is why we need social capital. This is why we need those networks to help us like understand that you're not going through this process alone. Those feelings of inadequacy or yes, we all feel at the same time. And so how do we combat that by like making sure that you have that support system so that you know like you are great, you deserve to be in these spaces and you do work really hard. And I think like we do this for ourselves and it also releases a lot of like stress and anxiety that we often feel. Um, yeah, so along with building that social capital, like Mani mentioned, it also gives us the opportunity to center ourselves. Um, and so the reward of building community is that it gives us the opportunity to focus and begin with our stories and our experiences when academia has ignored and silenced our stories or just rejected them altogether. So in building the confidence and in finding those networks and support, the reward of challenging imposter syndrome, you feel much more capable to show up fully as yourself and more confident in your classes to be able to engage with the material. Um, and so it, kind of takes it's almost like you're relieved of um feeling that kind of inadequacy because you know you have a support you know you have a network but also you're engaging with people that are feeling the same way so it's more like I did mention and Marisol mentioned it's a response to the environment that you're in and it's not about your capabilities in your program the imposter syndrome that you're feeling is typically a response to to the environment yes So we wanted to discuss three things that we've gotten out of sisterhood and academic amigas. So the first is growth. So we're growing first as scholars. So because we are in our PhD program, we're learning about what it what that means, what it means to be in grad school. And so what Mari had mentioned earlier about teaching or sharing resources for people about grad school is the beginning of like what is grad school when I was an undergrad I didn't even know what a PhD was I didn't know what grad school was what it meant to do a master's anything like that right and so we're growing as scholars like every day we're learning new things specifically about the hidden curriculum mm -hmm. and so from one another we're learning about what it is what it means to be in the academy and you know, how to make it out. And so even amongst each other, we're teaching each other things. And we're also collaborating with other folks in different programs or in our program who are a few years ahead. And they're willing to share their experiences, right? They're willing to tell us, for example, um, this is what you need to do to prepare for your qualifying exam in your program, or let's make study groups together. We're constantly growing as scholars. We're also growing as peers. So we're providing social and emotional support. And I wanted to emphasize on the emotional support. So because we are underrepresented in the academy as women of color, specifically as Latinas, we um, may experience height in imposter syndrome, right? So we feel like we don't belong because nobody else in the room looks like us. And so the emotional support is crucial because we may be emotionally exhausted facing microaggressions. I think even if people don't intend to do a microaggression, it comes off that way, right? And so the emotional support has really been vital in just being there for one another, as simple as like us having a breakdown because we can't finish a paper, right? It's not because I can't finish the paper, it's because I'm emotionally exhausted. And the negative talk is just so heavily internalized. But once again, like it's not our fault. It's not that we consciously decide to do this, but it's a response or just like the fear of failure. 
And so the emotional support that we've provided for one another is just being there for one another, you know, hopping on FaceTime and just talking things through or even honestly, like crying things out has been really important um, because maybe we don't have that support specifically within our program, but we have it outside, right? So we have it in the friendships that we've built. And so I think the emotional support has definitely been very important um, for, for our success. And then we're also growing as future professionals. So we're cultivating our identities in the field. We're teaching one another what it means to publish, to get published. Um, and some of the things that connect to the hidden curriculum is nobody is really telling us, well, you need to publish right now, but that's an important thing that if we want to get faculty positions or if we want to stay in the academy, we need to publish. And so there's no specific timeline, timeline as to what we need to do, but we're growing and we're learning what it means to be future professionals in our given field. Mm -hmm. um, I would also add to that. I know, sorry, yeah. Maddie. Um, that as future professionals too, we kind of foster a space for intellectual growth as well. I think between, even just between us, we you know talk about theory, we talk about research, and we try to also engage intellectually with one another. Um, and it also pushes us um, in that way as well, which will, is also foundational for ourselves as future professionals. That's very true. I was going to say sometimes if I read a theorist and I'm like, I read it two times and I have no idea. Que dijo. I have no, I, I did not understand anything he said. And I'm like, I'm like, Anna, have you read it? And she's like, yeah, do you want to talk about it? Or I did, do you want to talk about it over some cafe, whatever it is? Um, it's, it's very nice to have someone to have these discussions with. And I was going to go back to like the emotional support, like again, being in this process often you feel like you're alone and so like I've had instances where professors say like really mean comments to me about like my work or my writing or I'm not participating enough for them or the love or the participation I'm giving them mm -hmm. is not what they're looking for and so like I have felt like really isolated like for me I'm like he's pointing me out but then like talking with Anna and I did, then I realized like, no, they are also feeling like this. They're also getting these comments on their papers. And like, it's not a reflection of us and how we're writing, but really honestly, like sometimes I feel like my professors wake up on the wrong side of bed <laughs> and then they take it out on me. And I'm like, no, this has nothing to do with me. So I think that that has also been like really helpful is knowing like when you get a bad grade or when you get a bad, bad feedback, like how can you just brush it off your shoulder and move on because you're like it's fine this is why I'm here I'm to, I'm here to grow and like learn new skills mm -hmm. definitely so yeah so I want to discuss a little bit of like solidarity that we have grown um, with academic amigas and with each other through like peer mentorship um, a lot of what we do with each other and what I have received from others has been like consejos right um, this could be seen as nurturing advice, and this comes from our parents or extended family members or uh, friends, and they like simultaneously promote like educational attainment. And then also we use it as a um, survival and resistance against the cultural and societal constraints that are set against us. Uh, Consejos play a powerful role in Latino families because they establish a sense of self-worth and they build resistance against the challenges that we face um, outside of the home. And so we have seen this, um, I have felt this like from older scholars that have given me consejos about um, how to interact with certain professors because like I said, maybe they're being jerks or um, how to go about my writing process in order for it to be published or how to seek opportunities and uh, these consejos, this advice that they give me feels very much like familial to me. Like they are looking at me like I'm a little sister or like I am their sister and how they can help support me to be where they are, like when they're older. And this is something that um, I am constantly trying to do with those that I'm mentoring. Um, because you can have many different types of mentoring relationships with um whoever you're with your mentee like it can be very professional or it can be more uh, like a friendship that you're uh, that you're building so when I choose to mentor someone um, 
I love to interact with them very informally. I'm like, give me a call if you ever need help, give me a text, let's see how we can communicate the easiest. Um, and then this is when, when we're exchanging those consejos. So I also wanted to discuss, right, our peer mentorship, um, remembering always that like, as you're rising, um, you lift other people with you. It's so incredibly important. Um, when I was an undergrad, I did, a, it's called McNair Scholars Program. And so it really prepares undergraduate students for a higher level of research that will help them get into grad school. And every single year I write letters of recommendations for students, every single year I advocate for them. I talk to the director, um, I help them with their projects because it's incredibly important. Like I would have never known about that program had a, another Latino scholar not walked me to the office and then given me the application and then walked me through the application. And for me, that was like, wow, I can't believe he did all of that for me. Well, I wanna be able to do that for others. And I wanna make sure that they have, um, they give you extra money, they give you resources. I'm like, everyone should be able to have access to this. So it's incredibly important like for all of us as we continue to rise, how can we continue to lift others with us on this journey, right? We, like I said, there's not a lot of us up here so we need to continue to help. Um, and then also um, supporting one another, right? Building a team of people. And so uh, I know someone was talking, how do we build a sisterhood? This for a lot of us have been very informally. It was just, uh, we built this other group and it's called Lucha. And that one has a lot of scholars who are at this, at my previous university. And we were all Latinos and we just felt like we were all going through the similar struggles of being at a predominantly white institution. And it wasn't a formal, like um, a formal organization, but we would just get together every two weeks on Wednesday, everyone would bring snacks. And then we would sit around in a circle. And honestly, sometimes we would just cry. It would just be the space that we needed so that we could invent about all of the, like, the stuff that we were going through and all of the negative emotions that we were feeling and how isolated we were feeling in these programs. And so I guess the advice that I give for those who are saying, how can we build um, the sisterhood? How can we build this team? Uh, it doesn't always have to be so formal as in you joining a club, but also just identifying other people and like coming together to do anything. And now that we're on Zoom, I guess I would say making those Zoom meetings, you know? Yes. And I, I wanted to add on peer mentorship. I'm just gonna share a story about you real quick. Um, so this, the, the group that we had built, so Lucha Latinos Unidos con, a, con Honor y Amistad. Oh, yeah. um, so we would meet, right? And we would have dinner together. We were away from home. And so it was a space for us to have that home away from home and just share space. But I remember um, there, the McNair application was due, I think in a week. And there was an undergrad student who um, was interested in applying, right? And Mari was like, I hope you apply. It was literally due in a week and Mari helped uh, the student apply and she got in the program, she finished the program, she got her scholarship and everything. And so it's about just like, I feel like we constantly wanna get people to also join, right? Because they want to do X, Y, and Z. And so I think another advice would be like, definitely ask for help or just ask questions like people are always willing to help you that's how we've made it like this far we wouldn't have made it by ourselves there was always a whole bunch of people behind behind us like guiding us answering these questions and I know sometimes it feels silly to ask some questions because you don't know if you should know this and I still struggle with this like I get scared asking my advisor a question even though I know she is such a sweetheart she will not like judge me or anything but I'm just scared and so like that's an ongoing thing that um we still struggle with is just like asking for help and but definitely keeping in mind that people want to help you any way that they can they definitely will that is very true I think even now I feel like sometimes I get afraid that if I reach out to a professor or a faculty member because I want to work with them or I just want to talk to them about their research I get so nervous reaching out but they love talking about themselves <laughs> <laughs> and so and so if you if you write to them and you're like oh I really like this article that you wrote I would love to get together you know just for an informal meeting they're they're always gonna say yes and the worst thing that they can do is not reply to you I have had plenty of people not reply to me but that's okay then you reach out to someone else like then that's that's not the person that's supposed to be like in your group you know in your clique like 
you find those people by reaching out and it's like really difficult at first but like you can grow such great friendships from that definitely and so the last thing that we would say we've gotten out of building sisterhood is transformation so kind of talking what Talking about what Mari and Ida were just mentioning, taking solidarity and putting it into action is really important. And so one of the ways that um, we do that, like Marisol mentioned, was peer mentorship. So for me, for example, I also have a mentee who I share opportunities with her, offer to revise statements, you know, get her to see what college or grad school may look like. Um, and, you know, just kind of prepare her to see if that might be something that she may want to do in the future. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be 100%, but just keeping those options open for her and making sure that she knows that they're there. It definitely makes an impact and she's um, doing great so far. So um, it's definitely a really positive thing that we could do for others. Yes, thank you, Anna. And um... For me, like I have shown my transformation within the academy by participating in initiatives. Like oftentimes you need to sit at those tables with the head executive of whatever university you're at and, and have those conversations with them, right? Um, I have done this by serving on committees, like graduate committees, where I talk to my peers who are in my uh, department and I ask, what do you guys need from this institution so that you can be successful? And then I am the person who relays this information to, um, to the head faculty members so that they can implement these changes. But it's important for us to also take up spaces in those like uh, committees because those are the people that are like mostly making changes. And I have seen like a big difference in how they wanna hear back from us, but they just need to have the right people to sit there and actually tell them. Um, mm -hmm. on, like also, I have also served on different committees such as like social justice initiatives in my department and across the university, um, teaching other faculty members how to use critical race theory to ground their research, right? How can we make people of color not look like they're a deficit and not look like they're, they're, um, they're missing something, but how can we uplift them and what they do have um, and highlight that part of them in their research? So that's what's like been very important for me. How can I use my research and my research expertise um, to teach others how to implement this into the work that they're doing um, on their research? Yes. And then also transforming the academy, once again, just by being in these spaces, we are resisting the the institution that upholds whiteness, right? And so we hold positions like TA, so teaching assistant position where we hold the position of being instructors. And so first we're learning how to be a women of color instructor, right? So there's not, I don't know about y'all, but I, I feel like I've had maybe one or two Latina instructors. They weren't really at the tenure faculty position. I think they were just adjuncts. So once again, the disparities of the position representation that is in the academy is not at tenure faculty. So it's not like the highest level that you could get, but um, I've had maybe one or two Latina professors, very few people of color teaching, right? And so I can share that like when I've gone to talks and I see other women of color, or other Latina sharing their work, that is really inspirational to me. And that makes me feel like I can do that, right? And so, we're transforming the academy by having future goals to stay in the academy as faculty, as researchers. And the ways that we're learning how to get there is through sisterhood, right? Through building these peer mentorships. And then I think just representing student body is really important. One thing that I've noticed as a TA for intro level classes is that people come to you because they feel represented, right? And so the majority of people who come to my office hours and who stick around after class are women of color. And they feel comfortable sharing with me what's going on. They share that they're young mothers, that they're, they have multiple jobs, that they're, they have other responsibilities outside of school, right? And mm -hmm. us as first gen, as working um, class, we, we understand these struggles. Like they share this with me and I'm like, yes, I get it. Like I'm still in the same position. Right. And so I'm able to relate with one another and they're able to relate to me. And so I think that's one of the unspoken things of like transforming the academy is that we really do want to become the faculty that we 
didn't really have in undergrad or even now in grad school. And that is one of the, the things that we hope to do in transforming the academy. Yeah, I was gonna say along with that, like by TAing, um, I have had the opportunity to advocate on behalf of my students, mostly in this last year where, you know what, sometimes faculty are so far removed from students that they don't understand that, that they're struggling. But I get it because I'm also a student, right? <laughs> I, I'm like, whenever my students are like, you are assigning too many readings and I'm like, I know I also have to read them to, in order to teach them to you. I understand. I know how you're feeling. Um, but given this position, I get to speak on their behalf and advocate to like, let's have less readings. How can we make this class more engaging and less about like reading dense work instead of like short pieces that we can have like really good conversations about, right? Or how can we extend the deadline? How can we just be kind to all of the students that you're teaching? Because like, they are also going through it. Like they mm -hmm. also need extensions. They're also tired. And so I feel like a lot of the work that we're doing right now being TAs is really vital to how our students are coping with living in the middle of a pandemic and still having to take all of their online courses and, and dealing with everything that's happening in their lives at the same time. Okay, so um, how can you all build sisterhood to combat imposter syndrome? So we wanted to take into account that this could look so many different ways for different people. And so it's important for folks to one, meet themselves where they're at. Um, we don't obviously want folks to do anything that they're uncomfortable with or anything like that, but just acknowledging like, what do I feel comfortable? How do I feel comfortable engaging with folks? Um, and do I, can I put myself out there? So one example I was maybe thinking of is like, if I like, if I may be too nervous to maybe email a professor whose article I really liked, I can follow them on Twitter or Instagram or see how they engage in other ways. Um, and that's also a way, another way for you to connect. Um, so connecting online via Twitter and Instagram, academic Twitter's pop in, academic Instagram is pop in academic TikTok, I'm sure is on the come up. So those are all spaces where there's like a lot of interesting conversations for people to have and engage with. Um, joining networks on campus or virtually are also important. Um, reading scholars you like and familiarizing yourself with your field of study and what you wanna do just gives you a sense of um, like what you wanna do in terms of like your academic discipline, but also it helps you feel more prepared. You kind of get an idea, like what are the popular names that I'm hearing in my field? Um, and so all of those things are really um, just maybe simple ways of engaging, but they're, they are really fundamental. I would also add like podcasts. There's podcasts of like, you know, I was listening to Site Black Women podcast this morning and that was so informative and so just, um, intuitive just to hear other women talk about their experiences in the academy. So that's another way that I just came off the top of my head. But those are some really good ways of building sisterhood to combat imposter syndrome. Yeah, and adding to the joining networks on campus or virtually. So as we've shared, we've just organically grown networks, right, of people who are like us and who are going through similar journeys. And so even if you don't have like a formal club or organization on campus, you can one, create that formal organization, right? But it can also be informal where you hold each other accountable. We all have really busy schedules, but just meeting at least once a month, every two weeks for an hour just to check in on one another is really important and that just helps ground yourself. And like Mari had mentioned, like you're not the only person going through all of this, right? So just hearing each other's stories of success can really help with imposter syndrome and just feeling that connection with others. Yeah, I was gonna say, I know Anna and I, they have like different communities apart from the ones that we share that they're in. And so I, I have recently, I was just 
talking to one of my friends and I was like, it's so hard for me to sit down on and just write when I'm on my computer all day. And she was like, we have a virtual writing group that we use. And we used to get together every single like week and write together in the same room, but now we can't. Mm -hmm. And we have a Zoom link where and a group chat where we're like, hey, does anyone want to hop on Zoom and write from 5 to 8 p.m. today? And then we hold each other accountable and we make Pomodoros. So like for 25 minutes, we write and then five minutes, we check in with each other. And I'm like, did you reach your goal these 25 minutes? What are you hoping to reach in the next 25 minutes? Um, do you just need accountability? Do you just need to sit in front of a computer with someone? And it has been so instrumental in the way that my writing has gone this semester. Yesterday, I wrote until 8 p.m. because I just had someone there and I felt like I can't let her down. I need to stay here with her because mm -hmm. I need to help her finish. She had a, like a, a deadline today. And um it just popped out of nowhere. And now I have five new friends. Like it just, I just met them all last week and I've hung out with them every single day virtually, but like, it's been just so incredible to, to build that as well. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do want to add to the chat about the importance of the informal interactions and in retaining students. I think as we've mentioned, like if it wasn't for one another and all of the communities that we've built, we may probably not have been here, right? If we're not here checking each other. I think that's also one of the things is like the tough love that we give one another when we're falling through the cracks and we're like, well, maybe I'm not that smart. Maybe I can't do this. Like, yes, you can. Like, I can help you. Or mm -hmm. just like not taking the, the, the opportunities that we should be taking right like applying to scholarships sometimes we might be like well like I don't know if I qualify for this scholarship this position this job or whatever and it's like yeah you do like you're more than qualified so I think just checking on one one another informally it definitely and retaining students at every level for sure yeah okay so yeah so along with um all of this and we've been talking a lot about different types of communities that we can create I wanted to share some of the networks that I personally interact with on social media and academic amigas interact with and so this is some of the Instagram pages that we follow and that we personally uh, communicate with they all provide resources at different levels they all provide different types of support um they all provide just fun so we wanted to share some of these that we thought maybe you guys would also gain from um they're all of us are our amigas i'm thinking about all of the all of the groups that we have and this is another one right mm -hmm. we all have a group chat we all talk to each other we all help each other out like since we all have platforms on social media we're like mm -hmm. okay i just got this would this work for you guys or you guys should apply to this and so um Apart from that, this is another space for us as women to kind of follow each other and support each other. And um, yes, I know all of us provide different um, like groups for different women because I know one of them has a writing group. Who is it? Uh, it's Valerie, Latina, Valerie grad Latina grad guide. Yes, she has writing like cafecitos on Saturdays and she everyone gets together and write. And so we just wanted to showcase some of our favorites um, that we interact with that maybe will be helpful for you as well. Yes. And so I think these these are all their Instagram handles. I'm sure they're on other platforms. The handles may vary, but this is also one start in creating sisterhood, right? And through these uh, through these social media platforms, we've even built relationships with people that just quickly DM us and ask us questions, and we're more than happy to answer that, to share resources, or just they're as simple as like, I think last time we got a DM of like, how do I negotiate funding? Because we had posted on how you should negotiate your financial aid when you get into grad school. And I was like, I got you. Here's one thing that we did. Here are some questions you should keep in mind. But we also asked in the group chat, like, hey, who has more resources? And so we're constantly helping one another and sharing the knowledge that somebody told us because we don't want to keep that information. right? We want to share it with everyone. And that is all we have for our workshop. So once again, thank you for joining us. We just wanted to share some pictures. So here um, we are, Maddie graduated undergrad and Anna and I graduated um, from our master's programs. And then we also had like a cute little photo shoot when we got into our PhD program. That's just us hanging out. Like 
we're just trying to ground each other and keep a balance. Like, yes, we're academics, we're working in the academy, but, you know, just give yourself space to grow personally and just um, outside of these academic spaces, right? We're really good friends. And that is our Instagram. If you want to follow us, we created a cute little website that is up and running and we're also on TikTok now. So <laughs> if you all wanna um, keep in touch, that is how you can reach us. Yes, I wanted to go back yeah. to one of the, so now I think we, we can do a Q and A. Um, yes. If anyone has any questions, I was thinking of the one where she said, how can we keep friends or how can we keep sisters? And I was gonna mm -hmm. say, you need to show up for each other. Like showing up for each other is some of the most important things that we can do for each other. Um, and all of the groups that we have, right? It's, it's so important to be there to support each other at whatever capacity you can. And asking each other, like, how can I best support you with whatever you're going through? Uh, I think it's very important dedicating that time, right? Yes. Another one. Yeah. So if y'all um, have questions, you can write it in the chat. And then Gabriela, do we have the option for people to unmute themselves? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, if you want to unmute yourself and ask something or write it in the chat, whichever way you feel comfortable, we're open to answering. Mm -hmm. About anything that we've shared or outside of that. Okay, do you want to read it? Yes. So any tips for balancing grad school and a full-time career? Very good question. <laughs> um, I guess, am I the one who has the most jobs? Mm, at the moment, yes. We've yeah. all, I feel like I've held like four jobs in undergrad at one given time. Yes. So <laughs> yeah. um, any... Uh, Yes. Okay. So I guess for me, I currently, and yes, also before I always held like three jobs and then an extra job just to get me over to like, actually be able to financially afford my life. It, and then I don't even live in luxuriously. I can <laughs> barely be making it, but um, honestly, I make all the other jobs work for me. Like if I can work at both of them at the same time or figuring out where I I can um work two things simultaneously I will say it is very difficult for me to balance it I do work on the weekends and I do work at night and I I do overwork myself I think it is way better at um having a true balance between school and work life thank you <laughs> so I think one of so I can speak on like my personal experience of like balancing grad school. So all of the jobs that we have and even academic amigas, right? That's a job that we have is it, it accumulates to more than being full time, right? I think one of the things that has helped me is uh, it also depends on when you work best. I work best at night. And so what I do is I take my mornings to myself. I do whatever I feel like I need to do, like I clean my room, I take a shower, I make breakfast, I chill, chill out for a few minutes, and then I prepare myself. So like, if you work better in the mornings, you can take some time, right, to prepare yourself for the day. I think it's important to, to realize that the, your job is always going to be there, your work is always going to be there, like you're never going to stop, you're, you the sad reality is even if you feel like you're ahead of things, there's still going to be another thing that you forgot about doing. And so just taking the time to like, okay, my job is there and it's important and you should give it your all, but you're also a person. And if you're burnt out, then there's no way you can produce good work. Right. And so our work is writing and researching. And so if I'm tired, if I didn't get enough sleep, if I didn't have breakfast, then I can't write and I can't do my job. So I think one of the things is balancing is like definitely first 
tending to yourself and your needs both physically and emotionally but also having like a set schedule I think we all have like a million calendars on our phones on our google calendar even written out like I'm looking at my desk right now I have like three things that tell me what I need to do um and so I think one concrete thing is like really scheduling out time um whether that is on the weekdays or on the weekends of all of the things that you need to do prioritizing them um this is a good plug into our academic page we have <laughs> some um posts on like what we do and so like on Sundays you may want to write everything that you have for the week that you need to do and really prioritizing what comes first or what's more urgent um, would be one of the things for balancing work. And then also just keeping in mind, you can say no to things. Like even if we feel like superhero sometimes, there's the, the amount of things that we can take up um, may, may vary at times. So definitely balancing that and what you can do, I would say. Is I I would also add, if possible, I know I'm, I I know it might be difficult, um, but if if it's possible to have at least one hour for yourself a day, mm -hmm. whether it's at the end of the day or in the beginning, but completely you, whether you're meditating, whether you're just you know debriefing from the day, even if your day is busy, I've had summers where my day was seven a.m. to nine p.m. Monday through Thursday. And I had to, you know, the hour that nine to 10 o'clock at night that I got before I went to sleep was on me. And so I think that the, mm -hmm. that was something that I really needed for myself to be able to handle how busy I was and just give myself the space to cry and to be frustrated um, mm -hmm. was really, really important for me just to get through all of that. Because even if we have all of these um, commitments, mm -hmm. like I still felt obligated to all of them. And that even, even when I'm ha handling so many things at once, if I drop the ball on something, that will, is totally okay. You will come back from that. It will not eat you up. You will make it. And so I'm wishing you the best um, in balancing that because I know it's difficult, but I hope that was helpful. Yeah. I was going to say, always ask for extensions because I dropped the ball just today. It happens to all of us. I was like, oh, I have a midterm due today that's 10 pages, you know how much I have, nothing. And then I reached out to my professor and I was like, hey, I'm preparing for ARA next week. I'm submitting my thesis, I'm writing this chapter. Can I please have an extension? She was like, yeah, girl, go ahead, take it. You know, I was like, well, that's fine. You, I just had to ask her and, and, and we got it done. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I can start with the obtaining undergraduate research. So you can, um, do it through like a an organization so uh, the Ronald E McNair program is one of them and then also SROP uh, SROP you can apply to at um, you apply through one application and then it codes you with all of the R1 institutions that are connected to that one and through that one you are um, thank you Anna you are mm -hmm. able to receive uh, a mentor and that mentor uh, is a faculty member and they literally walk you through an entire research project and on top of that they give you funds so that you can go present your research at different institutions for free they pay for everything honestly really look out for those programs they were super helpful then they help you they give you GRE classes for free so you can prepare for grad school and then they also give you all your graduates your graduate school applications for free as well so those are two ways but I do want to say those are not the only ways of obtaining undergraduate research experience also there's faculty members um, who need uh, students to do their coding for them or they're transcribing from them and they pay I think they pay 15 to 17 dollars so honestly, like meeting with your faculty um, and just having conversations with them, you never know if they have a position available. Um, I know my roommate last year, that's what he did. So you need to like, there's still research opportunities available, even though you have no experience. Never take yourself off of the table because whatever you don't know how to do, you could just learn how to do before the interview, girl. Don't worry about it. Just like prepare for it. Just be like, yes, I know how to work Excel. No, I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. But um, never sell yourself short. Um, additionally, I think you did a senior thesis, right? So you can speak to that research. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't do McNair, but my institution had something similar that was like the honors program. So I think researching the institution that you're at, like what programs do they have 
where you can get some experience on getting research, like whether that's a thesis or a senior project in order for you to finish your program um, is a start. And so I just did research under a faculty and that was like sort of the first glimpse of like, how do you complete an institutional review board as an undergrad? So like, how do you conduct research? What, it, what does it mean to do research? Like, what does it mean to do interviews? How do you do them? How do you collect data and analyze them? Um, so even if there's not a faculty that can help you do that, you can always be the one to conduct that research. And so just connecting with the programs and the departments on campus, maybe you can do that as a thesis um, for your program. Yeah, I was going to say you need to make sure that every single thing you do in your class, you make work for you. Because I did like a super tiny mini research project in one of my classes. But when it came time for me to write to get into grad school, I wrote about it like it was like I was about to win an award for it because they don't know I did put in that work and you have to make every single thing that you do work for you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So someone also said if you want to answer your turn comparing yourself oh so how to deal with academic comparison, academic comparison. that's a that's a good point which i yeah. i kind of wanted to add to academic comparison but also the imposter syndrome so i think it's it's an ongoing journey right even though we come to realize that you know what we're not imposters we deserve everything that we've gotten right nobody has handed us anything out we've worked hard for it all i think it's even I've heard faculty say that they still feel like imposters, right? And so it's an ongoing journey. There may be an end in the near future. There may not be, right? We always have some type of negative self-talk or um, doubts about ourselves. So like keeping in mind that this, this will happen, right? You will feel the imposter syndrome, but you will also feel like academic comparison. Um, I think one of the things is just like a, a reminder that you're on your own journey, you're on your own timeline. Like we started at the same time, but we're all at different points in our program. So like everything looks different for us all. Um, we have different lives and different responsibilities outside of that. And so even though we started at the same time, like Anna did her qualifying exams because that's what her program required, right? I'm doing mine over the summer. Mari is doing hers next year. And so we're all at different stages in our program and in our careers. And so I think just reminding yourself that whatever you want to do, you'll get there. And you know what? Some people got there sooner than you, sooner than you, um, maybe because those opportunities were there for them, right? But just keeping in mind your opportunities and your um, chances are coming up. But then again, like I said, like, it's really difficult. I still struggle with that at times. So just understanding that it's a process and like everything is non-linear, it, it could just come back. Yes. That was great. Um, I also go ahead. had something to add to academic comparison. I want to echo so much of what I just said. And I struggle with this all the time. Like I still compare myself academically to other people. And I think part of that for me was realizing that I, it's like, what can I do instead of um, feeling inadequate to other, it was almost like a self-sabotage for me, I would say. I like utilized it in a way that um, even though I knew that I could do it, it still felt like, um, it still felt like I, I didn't want to give myself that. So I would say like, if that's kind of the angle where you're coming, like where you're coming from, I think just being honest and know that you can definitely do it. Um, it's not always going to be easy and it'll be hard, but like, it doesn't mean it's not, it's not possible. So, you know, you might struggle if, you know, grad school is difficult. I came in like feeling frustrated because I found things that were difficult for me when really it's like, I'm not gonna know everything the first time around. So just being kind to yourself and keeping that in mind. Definitely being kind to yourself, yeah. Our, um, yes, um, I, identifying our limiting beliefs is key. We need to focus on what we have accomplished to date. That reminds me of, I actually saw a video this morning that was 
talking about imposter syndrome. And it was like, when I want to combat that, I make a brag list. So what have I done up until this point that has told me that I can't do it? Nothing, because you've done it all. You did that. <laughs> so believe that. Yeah. Um, and so that's like the angle that I try to remind myself, but it's, you know, but yeah, brag list. What have you done that, that you've gotten to? You've did it all. You got mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So, you know, definitely have that confidence. You sometimes you just need people to remind you of it too. So maybe that'll be the homework for the day. Yeah. So we did want to do like a homework for this workshop, right? And um, so the list that we provided is like, these are some things that you can do to combat imposter syndrome, get you going in your educational journey. And so I think one of the homeworks could be you doing one of these things, right? Reflecting on where you're at, where you want to be at, or following somebody um, online, reaching out to somebody, like what is it that you can do? Or even like Anna shared the brag list, right? Making some affirmations for yourself or just writing down your successes. I think sometimes we forget about all of the things that we've done because we're chasing our next bag. And so I think that's also a reminder is like, you've done all of these things, like shout yourself out for them and be proud of them. You're not like being whatever, like you're just praising yourself for all the hard work that you've done. Um, So definitely taking the time to reflect on your successes. And so we did want to um, start wrapping up in terms of like, if if you all have any questions or if you can write in the chat, what's one thing that you could do after the workshop that you can commit to as homework? That would be great so we can now report. I also wanted to share another Instagram handle with you all that we did not include in the presentation. And that is on Instagram if you want to follow. Okay, so I'm going to read some of them. So reduce the amount of doubt and put more confidence in the work that you do. Definitely a good start. Ask yourself, what am I telling myself? Evidence that isn't true. What will tell my, what will I tell myself? What supports do I need to move forward? What powerful steps can I take to move forward? Positive affirmations, weekly, daily, and also checking in on others. Those are two good points. Yes. Yes, do not do it alone. Do not. <laughs> don't do it alone. You don't have to. Um, yeah. And just because, and maybe you can, right? But does it mean that you should? Do, uh, you know, so like oh, also taking that into account. Yeah, definitely not doing it alone. So I know we've gone over our hour. Are there any last questions or comments? We can also turn it to Gabriela if you don't have anything else to add. Just know we're all rooting for you and please join our Academic Amigas family. We would love to continue supporting you. And for those of you who had questions about the uh, MED or uh, PhD in education route, you can always reach out to me via Academic Amigas and we can set up a meeting or we could just message about it. Um, But yeah, I would love to continue supporting um, those of you who do need it. And yeah, I'm so excited. Thank you guys so much for having, uh, having us. I'm very grateful to have shared this space with you all today. Mm-hmm. definitely thank you all ladies you have been so amazing and so powerful i am so happy that i was able to join um today's workshop my name is marisol velasquez and i'm the dean of students at morton college gabriela as a wonderful colleague that she is she took um she's my support system here at the college so she mm-hmm. um took on uh, moderating the first part of this um session so thank you gabriela for being that support system that the ladies have talked about throughout today for me um thank you ladies and let's give them a round of applause and let's show them some love, our speakers, by using the Zoom reactions. All of you have been using them throughout, so please um, give them a little bit more love. 
we want to invite you to our final conference um, keynotes. Um, it's actually our keynote speaker that's happening tonight. So if you don't have any plans, please join us at 6 p.m. The title of the workshop is Prepare for Flight of, for the Flight of Your Life, The Power of Landing on Your Dreams. Our keynote speaker is Jacqueline Camacho Ruiz. And um, our fabulous Gabriela Mata is going to put the link there if you in our chat, which you already did, see? <laughs> and she, um, so that way you can register for for us. Um, register yourself, please. Um, and you can join us in our final um, workshop of the, of the conference. And lastly, we do want to remind you that we are surprising a lucky winner with conference swag bag, um, which has all these amazing um, things regarding our conference. So please make sure to keep on checking our, our website and join um, the last workshop of the, uh, of, of the conference so you could win additional goodies. Again, ladies, on behalf of the college we are so thankful that you have created this wonderful and positive space for women of all um different walks of life to join this um and share with them your experience love to hear you thank you so much